Good afternoon and welcome to the first Dean's Forum. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you. My name is Jeffrey Arthurs. I'm the interim dean of the Hamilton campus, and this is the first Dean's Forum. We did this debate about five or six years ago, and it was a real hit with the students. So I thought, well, it's time to bring it back and to get us started off with some energy and some interest on a controversial topic, but not a topic that any of us would go to the stake for. So a little bit edge to it without being too controversial. We thank the Swetland family for providing the financial resources for this forum. We have the Swetland Lectures. Dr. Ken Swetland was a longtime professor here in pastoral ministry, and he died just a year or so ago. And this is our Swetland event, the Swetland Lectures for this uh, event. Next month, the Dean's Forum will be sponsored by the Pendleton Lecture. Dr. Ray Pendleton recently retired after many, many years at Gordon-Conwell. He's still around. He's teaching as an adjunct. And we'll have the Pendleton Lecture focusing on issues of counseling. And next month, we have a guest coming in to talk about trauma, how to minister to people who are, have been traumatized. And then in November, another great topic, another guest coming in uh, from California uh, for talking about the uniqueness of Christ in a pluralistic world, how to share Christ. It's not easy this day. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How do you share that message in a way that can be heard and received in this pluralistic world? That'll be in November, November 5th. Our special guest will be Carrie Heddington. You can look her up on the web and find her organization. Then may I flag for you just one uh, Dean's Forum for next semester. It's a long time from now, but I just want to put, put it in your minds now. In uh, March, we will have the director of the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission from Washington, D.C., my friend Sharon Gustafson, who was a former board member here. And Sharon is an expert in employment law, and she's going to talk about religious liberty and hiring. That may sound as dry, dry compared to these other topics, but think about it. Religious liberty, what rights, legal rights, do religious organizations like your church, like this school, like Gordon College down the road, what rights do they have with hiring and not hiring, specifically issues of same-sex marriage and so forth, religious liberty and employment law. That's coming up in March. But today, we have a debate about baptism. Will our four panelists please take your places on stage? We have Dr. Douglas Stewart. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, and also uh, a quick announcement that we are live streaming, so we welcome those guests also who are with us uh, from TV land. And our panelists today are Dr. Doug Stewart, professor, longtime professor, our, our longest tenured professor here at Gordon-Conwell in Old Testament. Next to him is Dr. Jack Davis, our second longest professor here, I believe, if I have that right, in theology and ethics. Then Dr. Eckhard Schnabel, our distinguished professor of New Testament, and Dr. Jim Singleton in pastoral ministry. And they're going to speak in that order. And we have two people representing believer's baptism, two people representing pedo baptism, uh, infant child baptism. And we will hear their cases, five minutes each followed by two-minute rebuttals or follow-up speeches, and then we open it up to you for Q&A and dialogue. Dr. Stewart. We love each other a lot. We're proud of each other. It's great to be part of this panel with these uh, really bright people. 
Professor Davis and I have been through this process a number of times, and he still speaks yeah, to me. It right. is just evidence of real godliness. <laughs> that's um, right. That's but right. We, we will try to be as clear and as hard-hitting in the best sense as we can be. So don't attribute that to enmity. Attribute it to a love for the truth in which there is really a, a benefit that comes from uh, frank consideration of issues and um, not pulling punches with regard to eager seeking of the truth. I, I certainly want to emphasize to you that um, there's an important uh, responsibility that you've got. This is an issue that comes up in everybody's ministry. And uh, you can't pastor a church without encountering uh, people who have been baptized as infants. And if you are uh, a believer's Baptist, uh, baptizing pastor, that's a, a significant issue for you. It's going to be an issue for you uh, on the mission field. It's going to be an issue for you sometimes in counseling. Well, you wouldn't expect it, but it will sure come up. In 50 years of pastoring, I've had thousands of hours of counseling, and it's amazing the things that come up. So um, I want to start then with uh, several points, and there'll be many more responses and so on that we each make back and forth. And if any of you love what I say, then you can leave right after my part, and it'll save you the rest of your day. It's just a thought. Okay. We teach Greek and Hebrew here for a reason. And we teach it because we really believe that the Word of God uh, is authoritative for our faith and practice, and we want our views and our practices to be based on the Scripture. There's a terrible danger, it seems to me, a danger that the Reformers shed blood for, and that is of accepting tradition as if it were equal to Scripture. And everybody, all of you, need to decide, will you really hold to sola scriptura, that the Bible is the authoritative source for your understanding of your faith and practice, or will tradition come into it? And uh, there's also such a thing as a, quote, theologically constructed argument where certain ideas are accepted and then from those extrapolations take place and people come up with beliefs that are not actually exegetically sound. There's no exegesis behind the, quote, theology. In other words, there can be bad theology. So the fact that people say, well, the argument isn't biblical, isn't exegetical, but it's theological, um, is kind of something that I recommend people be very cautious about. And I would argue, too, that the very mode of baptism, the very meaning of the word in Greek, which is to plunge, to submerge, to drown, to sink, has all those kinds of meanings, um, is evidence of the fact that since few of you who believe in pedobaptism will actually plunge any babies under the surface of liquid, you'll, you'll just do a little moisture transfer. That's all you'll really do. Um, uh, consider that the very mode as described by the words in, in the Greek text um, speaks to the issue of uh, what is the nature of baptism and how are we to practice it. Um, I also think it's important to read well. Read a, a very fine study of uh, baptism in the New Testament, that's the title, by Beasley Murray. Look it up, Beasley Murray, Baptism in the New Testament. Covers an awful lot of territory and gives the arguments on both sides and the New Testament evidence and so on. Or, if you want to save time, you can read anything written by Schnabel on baptism. <laughs> because I think it's dispositive. I think it's, he really simply uh, presents the material. And this stuff is online. You can read those articles. They, they're partly in journals, partly online, but some of it's online. And I, I think it is just admirably done. We, we live in an age where we really can get access to all the Greek materials. And Schnabel has put them together and made the case for believers' baptism exegetically. And if you believe that you exegete the scriptures to know the truth, that's the direction to go in. Um, watch out for tradition. There's the argument, oh, the church has done this for the centuries and the millennia, and so why shouldn't it be right? Be very careful, because if you accept tradition, you're going to accept the veneration of Mary. Uh, because that's been going on for millennia. Or you'll accept 
baptismal regeneration, the notion that it saves you. That's been going on for millennia. Prayers for the dead, monastic orders, the priesthood, celibate priesthood. How about cardinals and how about the papacy and how about a Roman papacy? Millennia of tradition for all those false ideas. And so if you're going to make an argument that says, oh, the church has been doing this for a long period of time, you really have a very weak argument. Now, the desire for infant baptism is well motivated. Parents want their kids to go to heaven. And they want their kids to somehow have whatever advantage can be given in growing up uh, to turn out to be believers in Christ when they're adults. Um, the problem is there are also uh, results of, that, of the notion that that justifies infant baptism. You're going to encounter in your ministry lots and lots of people who um, say, I don't remember my baptism, it had no meaning for me, whatever. So you get a meaningless baptism process from the point of view of believers. They come to faith in Christ eventually, didn't mean anything. And um, uh, uh, it, it sometimes is a wonderful opportunity actually to baptize them the right way. And I certainly recommend that, that you be prepared for that in your ministry to be ready to give people a meaningful baptism that is a symbol of their coming to faith in Christ and a, a symbol of their regeneration rather than some kind of hopeful process. I find also in my 50 years of ministry that um, Parents think they've done their job. I know you get them to give vows. I will do this and that for my child and we'll work on it. The child will come to faith and so on. But they think that once that child is baptized that their job is done. It happens far more frequently than you would imagine. Uh, a final point, and I think my five minutes are up. Does baptism equal circumcision? Standard argument all the time raised in the Old Covenant, circumcision was what led you into the people of God, and so baptism is what leads you into the people of God, and let's make sure that children get to be led into the people of God, and there are arguments for that related to um, what I think are wrongly exegeted uh, statements in the scripture. But in fact, um, in the Old Testament, circumcision gets you into physical Israel, not the Israel of faith that Paul so clearly delineates in Romans and Galatians. It gets you into physical Israel. It's a physical initiation into physical Israel. What baptism does is not that. Remember, that physical initiation was for men only. So if we were to say, let's baptize only boys, we'd at least be on a better track. You want to let circumcision in the Old Testament govern what you think about baptism in the new, uh, then by all means, don't baptize girls because that's inappropriate. And uh, th th therefore, there's this tendency to think because of this Old Testament circumcision that what uh, is actually overtly stated in Deuteronomy 30, and that is that in the new age, the age to come, the covenant age, the age of restoration, <coughs> excuse me, um, circumcision will be of the heart. That's the thing. It'll be of the heart, of the mind. It'll be a matter of belief, a matter of faith. That's what, of course, Paul picks up on in the New Testament when he talks about the circumcision of Christ. And secondly, remember, there's the Old Testament birth. Yes, you're born an Israelite, but Jesus says that's not what works. What works is being born again. And that's what baptism lo logically follows upon. Well, I have uh, nine more points, but that, that should do well, and if you want to leave now, go ahead. That's right. <laughs> but you're certainly welcome to uh, stick around, and I hope you will. But I... Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Arthurs and others for setting up this uh, forum. I've been looking forward to it. It's a high interest topic. And uh, I have three, three points I'd like to make briefly, the third of which may have to be left to the uh, Q&A and re response period.
But at the very beginning, I think it's good to clarify what, what is the real question before us. And I think the real question before us is not whether or not there's a biblical uh, and New Testament warrant for the uh, baptism of adult uh, converts. I mean, that's very clear. And I think all four people uh, here at the table agree on that. I think the real issue that has arisen both in modern church life and actually in the early church is what, what theological or biblical basis do we have for recognizing the status of the children of those who have come to faith as adults? And uh, that, that particular issue only arose, you might say, with uh, you know, greater visibility in the post-apostolic uh, period. So the real issue is, do we have a theological basis here for recognizing the fact that the children of believers are in fact, uh, in some real sense, a member of the new covenant family of God, just as uh, the children of believers, just as Abraham's children were recognized as part of the covenant community in the old covenant. So my first point would be to point you to the handout, in which I make uh, hopefully a succinct uh, uh, case for the uh, baptism of the infant children of, believing, of at least one believing parent, and this is uh, from the Reformed and uh, Puritan uh, tradition. It doesn't presuppose baptismal regeneration or any magical thing like that. But as you will see there, it's really based on the Abrahamic Covenant, which, uh, as you will recognize, the Abrahamic Covenant is the backbone of the redemptive theology of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the, uh, the good news of the Gospel in the New Covenant is that we as Gentiles are now uh, it can access the blessings promised to Abraham. It is the Abrahamic covenant, which is the foundation of, uh, of uh, salvation and faith in both of those uh, particular uh, covenants. And likewise, I think one shouldn't uh, too readily dismiss the circumcision uh, a baptismal uh, analogy, which Paul himself points out, as you know, in Colossians 2, 11 and 12. Uh, and I think as we think about the theological significance, the spiritual significance of, of circumcision in both Testaments, especially the Old Testament, really the pivotal text is Romans 4.11, where Paul's understanding of the theological significance uh, of, of circumcision is not fleshly. He says it is the sign and seal of the righteousness which Abraham had by faith before he was circumcised. And so Paul's theology uh, of circumcision is based on the adult experience of Abraham. But consistent with the command of the covenant of God, it is to be applied to people like Isaac even prior to their full confession of faith. That was God's plan. So that, that's, uh, I, I just briefly, number one, <clears throat> refer to uh, the classical reformed case uh, based on covenant theology, the continuity of the Abrahamic uh, covenant, and the Pauline uh, parallel, spiritual parallel, between baptism and circumcision. Point number two, how my mind has changed. It hasn't changed in, in fundamental respects, but it has changed, I think, uh, on this issue uh, in a significant respect in that uh, I've, I've viewed uh, in, in a different way a fundamental assumption that I made and I think which many of you made, and that is that in this question uh, as to, uh, to whom baptism should be administered, that there is only one biblical answer possible. Now let me just say here that I think on many questions of uh, faith and, and life, there is one acceptable answer. Uh, did Jesus Christ rise bodily from the dead on the third day? There's one right answer. Is Jesus Christ fully God and fully man? Are there three co-eternal, co-equal uh, persons in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, equal in divine power, glory, and authority? Yes, there's only one right answer. But I think in terms of some matters of practice in church government and church policy, there may be more than one acceptable answer for which different groups and traditions can find a justifiable warrant for their positions. And so I think that uh, I, I recognize that the, uh, my Baptist uh, colleagues here uh, can make very strong and justifiable arguments for the baptism of adult converts. And again, that's, that's uh, controversial. But I think their understanding of scripture is not quite as nuanced as it needs to be to answer other important questions that arose in the post-apostolic uh, period. So in this case, I've come to the conclusion that on the matter of uh, the subject of baptism, 
Uh, it may not be an either or, but a both and, and that both Presbyterians and Baptists can make plausible, maybe not airtight arguments uh, for their position based on the nature of the text and the arguments. Now let me just mention my third point and try to develop this later, perhaps in conversation, and that is that I do see, uh, as a, someone in, in the Presbyterian Reformed tradition, I see three serious flaws with the Baptist hermeneutic. Three serious flaws. Let me just quickly enumerate those. Number one, I think that the Baptist hermeneutic is not uh, historical enough. I'll explain that as I, best I can. Number two, that it's not sufficiently contextual in uh, recognizing the full context of the New Testament writers. And number three, I think the Baptist uh, hermeneutic is inconsistent and in that it's very difficult to apply to other questions of church polity. For example, I have this brochure. I don't have copies for everyone. This brochure is called Infant Dedication in the New Testament. And here, this is a list of every explicit reference to infant dedication in the New Testament, which is some of my Baptist uh, friends practice. And let me, it, it's quick to read. Uh, and I have another uh, brochure called New Testament Ministers Performing Weddings and Funeral Ceremonies in the Church. So the question of how or what practice and how we justify our church practices requires uh, maybe a, a more thorough reading of scripture. And let me just uh, stop and say that in terms, but, but when I say that I think the ba traditional Baptist hermeneutic is not historical enough, I think there's uh, an insufficient recognition of the particular nature of the sources that we have in the first century. And these writings were written basically in a 50 year period, okay? Roughly between the uh, time of 50 AD and the 90s of the first century. They're, they are limited in time. And the writers of the New Testament documents, the sources that we have for this question here, are not focused on this particular issue. They are focused on the question as to whether or not Jesus is the, is the Jewish Messiah. Okay? They are focused on the meaning of the crucified. Why do you have a crucified Messiah? They're, what is the meaning of uh, the death of Jesus? They are focused on issues such as uh, can Gentiles be incorporated uh, into this new thing called the church here without being circumcised and without uh, eating, uh, the, uh, following the dietary laws? Those are the questions. And there are other questions of interest to later generations of Christi uh, Christians, for example, as to whether or not the days of Genesis 1 have to uh, mean 24 hours. Other questions such as uh, in the, what's at the center of the solar system? Is it the earth or the sun? Other questions such as, is evolutionary biology consistent or can it be consistent with biblical doctrines of creation? Those issues are not addressed by the New Testament. And you have to uh, take in the full range of all relevant e uh, evidence, not only in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament, uh, patristic literature, Jewish literature, and literature from natural revelation. So I think that uh, the Baptist hermeneutic is not historical enough. Number two, I think it's not contextual, fully contextual enough, uh, which is the type of exegesis which you're taught to do here at Gordon-Conwell, by the way, and that you can't read or should not read the New Testament with, uh, in a vacuum, historical vacuum, that doesn't take seriously the Jewish and intertestamental context, which was the context of the first century church and also the early Christian church the witness of the church fathers. And by the way, there's no early church father that, that says that infant baptism was not apostolic. The earliest critic of infant baptism, Tertullian, in the beginning of the third century, uh, does not say it wasn't apostolic. He just says it should be uh, delayed because of his erroneous view that post-baptismal sins could, could not be forgiven and so forth. So not contextual enough. And I think the third uh, uh, serious flaw in the Baptist hermeneutic is that it is very difficult to apply inconsistently. If you say we could never consider baptizing infants because you cannot point out to me a single explicit example, okay, of an infant baptist, and I cannot, okay, I would, I would freely admit that I, I don't think the Baptists can prove that there uh, were no uh, infant baptism, the first century house baptism, all that, and I will freely admit as a presbyter, I cannot prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that there were infant baptism, okay? Uh, one has to uh, argue probabilistically in the air, air of all the evidence uh, available to us. So, but if you say, I'm, I'm not going to do anything in the church 
except that for which I have either an explicit New Testament command or an explicit example, again, you should not dedicate infants either. And uh, show me an example of a New Testament minister performing a wedding ceremony. Can you name a single woman by name who you know came to the Lord's table in the Eucharist? Okay, now I think you can find good biblical warrants for all of those practices. But you may have to not limit uh, your primary sources simply to that uh, narrow range of documents written in a 50 year period in the first century here that represent the missionary first generation uh, situation of the church. My two friends uh, tried very hard to be brief. Uh, uh, unsuccessfully so. They spoke between 10 and 15 minutes. Uh, so I'll see what I can do. Uh, uh, first, a clarification, I never wrote on believers' baptism. Uh, I only wrote on the meaning of baptizo in the New Testament, and that's a different issue. Uh, first point, uh, what is the meaning of baptizo? Uh, those of you who read Greek, baptizo does not mean baptize. That's not a translation. That's a transliteration. Baptizo means insert into a yieldable substance. Some texts you have a sacrificial knife plunged into an animal and the word baptizo is used for that action. If Paul uh, had cut open his foot after walking uh, three weeks and uh, physician Luke was there and he put his finger into the wound, the word baptizo would have been used. Other words could have been used as well. Galen, uh, the medical doctor, end of the first century, early second century, uses baptizo for that. So, uh, um, uh, the, the entry for baptizo in BDEG, our general big uh, uh, Greek English lexicon, needs a new entry on baptizo. Uh, it is uh, a way too limited. Uh, baptizo was not a technical term uh, uh, when we get to the New Testament authors. We shouldn't assume, because the word baptizo was used for Christian water baptism, that therefore they never used the word in any other context. That is just not plausible at all. So that's just a, uh, a basic point. Uh, then, secondly, we have passages, which is completely uncontested, uh, where the word baptizo is used for Jewish immersion rites. So some of us who talk about baptism do know Second Temple literature in the Old Testament. Uh, they were used for uh, Jewish uh, immersion rites. Uh, and um, uh, in these passages uh, as well, uh, or in the Gospels, uh, Mark 1.44, Luke 2.22. Uh, uh, the Jewish rites of purification are often described with the noun katharismos, purification. Uh, that was the point of Jewish immersion rites, washing uh, in a ritual sense, uh, therefore uh, purification. Uh, again, there is no doubt about that, although there are some strange translations who insist on translating baptizo with uh, baptize even in Mark 7, and then you get uh, the baptism of cups, pots, and bronze kettles, which makes absolutely no sense. Uh, thirdly, um, uh, yeah, baptizo is used for the sinking of ships. It is used for people drowning. It's used in a metaphorical sense for people being swamped in debt. The word baptizo itself has nothing to do with water at all. Just read Greek text written before the New Testament. It's very obvious. Um, third point, uh, the, uh, the word baptizo is used for the immersion practice of John the Baptist. And what he did was so unique that he was given the description or the title, perhaps, ho baptizon, the baptizer or the immerser. Why? Because uh, he immersed people. He didn't invite people to immerse themselves, which was uh, the practice uh, in a uh, Jewish context. Uh, and so he immersed in the River Jordan uh, with a view towards their uh, commitment to be open to the coming uh, of uh, the Messiah. Fourth point, uh, uh, Jesus and his disciples baptized. Uh, there's only one passage. One passage is enough, if it's clear enough. John chapter 3. Uh, and again, there the 
uh, there is then a reference that a discussion arose between John's disciples and a Jew. Uh, and the Jews, they came to John and said, Rabbi, the one who was with you across the Jordan to whom you testified, here he is baptizing, and we are all going to him. Uh, so Jesus' practice of baptism raised the issue of purification. What purifies? And so evidently what Jesus and the disciples preached was surely linked to his message of the kingdom of God, not mentioned here by John, but that is the summary phrase for the message of uh, Jesus. And so his, uh, uh, practice, um, uh, uh, his uh, practice of uh, baptism did raise this issue. Number five, uh, 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 baptizo designating Christian water baptism. Uh, we, we could talk about Matthew 28, 19, uh, the so-called great Commission. Baptism is important. Baptism is not optional. Baptism is part of missionary work. And when you talk about missionary work, you talk about conversion. And that is the problem in Europe in mainline churches that most pastors don't talk about conversion. Because the notion is people have been baptized as infants, ergo, they are all believers, at least in a Roman Catholic uh, a, a view of baptism and uh, a, a, a a high Lutheran view of baptism as well. All our believers as infants, and, and so that's it, which is a rather large uh, claim to make. But I do want to uh, uh, very briefly talk about Acts chapter 2, uh, and that, I think, is the key text for Christian baptism. Uh, uh, the scene is uh, uh, Pentecost. Uh, uh, the scene is the uh, coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the first missionary evangelistic servant ever preached by Peter, who had denied Jesus just a few weeks earlier. Peter knew about sin and repentance and being reunited with uh, uh, the Lord. And when after his talk, uh, the Jews of Jerusalem uh, are affected in their hearts, they are convicted that they have been complicit uh, in the killing of Jesus and they are speaking what they uh, should uh, do. Uh, 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 he says, uh, repent and be baptized. And that is the sequence in the New Testament. And that's the necessary sequence in missionary work. There is repentance and then there is uh, uh, baptism. Uh, uh, he talks about baptism, or, or Jesus does so in Matthew 28, baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, in the name of is a formula that uh, indicates transfer, uh, at least mm -hmm. on a slightly uh, uh, less uh, uh, intense level uh, relationship. Uh, uh, baptism expresses a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And if such a relationship does not exist, uh, then um, um, uh, I, I would argue uh, baptism cannot happen. I finish with five points. People in the New Testament, they repent of their sins and come to faith in Jesus, the crucified Messiah in risen law. Second, people are immersed in water as a sign of purification. Third, people are immersed by a believer who presumably hears the confession uh, in Jesus, the crucified Messiah and risen Lord. Four, it is hearing and understanding the gospel. That is Jesus' great commission. And that is what is happening in uh, Acts chapter. It is hearing and understanding the gospel, repentance and faith. Uh, 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 in Jesus Messiah, which establishes a, a relationship with God, a relationship with Jesus, a relationship with the Holy Spirit, and that is expressed in uh, baptism. Number five, there's indeed not a single example of a person being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who has not heard the gospel. Yes, this is an argument from silence, but I could argue the uh, uh, oldest uh, child uh, or, or the youngest child of the jailer in Philippi was 17 years old. Uh, I mean, I can simply claim that. Uh, uh, it's just as plausible as to claim there were babies in that household. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, with that, I just want to close. I think I exceeded five minutes as well. <laughs> <laughs> Woe is me. This happened last time too. I was in the last seat and they ate up all the time by the time I got here. But I will try to show you that this can be done in about three minutes. So, <laughs> number one, I think our dean has 
mistitled what would be most helpful in this seminar, as his predecessor dean did, because all four of us believe in adult baptism. We absolutely do, and we practice that, and uh, there is no question that we would like to see people believe and then be baptized. The seminar should really be about whether we do infant baptism or infant dedication, because that's really where we have differences based on these things. Because if you believe in adult baptism as your only mode of baptism, then you have to somehow deal with the question, what do you do with little kids? Are they little pagans needing to be converted? Are they children of the covenant? And, and the theology around that is where the significance will lie. Now, personal testimony, I was a Presbyterian, grew up a Presbyterian, watched all this, got to seminary, realized that Hitler, Mussolini, and Stalin had all been baptized by, as infants, and I thought, you know, that's not really a very credible kind of uh, view of what goes on here. So I went into my own theological wilderness, and for the first four years I was a pastor, I did not do any infant baptisms in a Presbyterian church. Realistically, they shouldn't have let me get in the church doing that, but I was on a large staff and I declined from doing any infant baptisms. And then a resurrection and research of what I thought was a position, I changed my mind back, not really back, but to an improved position of how I understand children of the covenant. And we live in such an individualistic age the practice of baptism uh, for adults only has been mostly within the individualism of the modern era. And when you begin to understand how people are connected at the deepest level, you have to go back and begin to wrestle with the issue of covenant at a level. How are we related to those who come behind us? How are we related to children? Therefore, I would just posit, I don't think exegesis, as much as I value exegesis, I don't think exegesis is the final word on lots of issues ranging from church government to weddings to funerals. I think you've got to be integrative, which is why I love the practical theology department because we're trying to be integrative of church history, theology, the biblical text, and Christian practice. And there are just as many problems with children getting semi-adult baptized because of pressure from parents at eight years old and then really not knowing what they have repented of and needing to do it all over again. So the practice gets very muddy on both sides of the house. So if we're just going to look at practice, we've got to be careful. Obviously, you want to have a covenant household with intention to raise this child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And a Presbyterian never says that baptism regenerates. Remember, that's an argument for people not in this room. We would say that there is a subsequent experience where one does have to repent and believe and claim the baptism that was claimed for them. I will conclude with that. Bless you. Thank you. We have uh, two minute uh, responses, rebuttals now. And I will take the first rebuttal, Dr. Singleton. The title of our event is Baptism, Credo, Pedo, or Both. Oh, there I didn't go. read all of that. There you go. You. Got to read. You. I repent, and now I'm ready to be baptized. <laughs> Good. Okay, I've got 10 minutes because 10 is the new two. Just kidding. Um, Oh, good. Okay. Just remember the 50 bucks I gave you this morning. I would, I would recommend anybody that went over five minutes does not get two. So keep an eye on this, you guys. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Just, just go like this. At the two minutes are up. Yeah. Uh, two or three points. One, I really think we do need to uh, resolve each of us in his or her mind the uh, significance of what we're taught in the New Testament about the uh, definition of uh, what the scripture is and how it is the suitable source for uh, making these kinds of decisions. I would suggest to you that God knew perfectly well there would be a 21st century century 
when he inspired the text of scripture. And so the idea that it's in the first 50 years and that's the context and so on, that's way over culturalizing the word of God. God uh, is not culture bound and he knows all cultures and times and he wrote a Bible for all cultures and all times, including ours. And we should be able to trust what the scripture says and try to understand that with the best possible exegesis we can use. And you heard a lot of it in what Professor Schnabel said. Uh, secondly, I would say, uh, we need to be uh, very careful not to introduce practices that are not scriptural. So a couple of people mentioned uh, the fact that there's no warrant in scripture for dedicating babies. I completely agree with that. Don't dedicate a baby. The only warrant for dedicating is Old Testament dedication of firstborn males. There's no warrant in scripture for dedicating a baby. But people do it all the time because Parents are so used to the idea of infant baptism, they want to bring their kid and have it done. That's the word they use all the time. We want to have Ralphie done. So <laughs> I've heard it a million times. If I had a nickel for every time I had it, I wouldn't have to teach here for all the money they pay me. I, I, I would be able to be independent instead of being wealthy by reason of my salary. So anyway, don't do that. But have, if you want to have a ceremony, have a blessing. Blessings are all over the place in Scripture. You can have a prayer for a child. You can have a blessing, but don't call it a dedication. It's not. That's a separate kind of thing. Uh, we want to follow what the Scripture gives us as guidance, and we want those precepts, line upon line, to be obedient to God, who is the author of that Scripture and the author of our salvation. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Stewart. A couple of uh, quick uh, points. Uh, number one, uh, in, in my argument in favor of uh, pedobaptism, uh, I was not, my primary appeal was not to tradition. If you look at the handout there, it's a biblical theological argument. And, but I do believe that both Jewish practice uh, and the patristic witness supports the inference mm -hmm. that I make from uh, the biblical theology. Uh, second point uh, about baptizo and the lexical meaning of that. Uh, Dr. Schnabel, of course, is uh, uh, correct uh, uh, on that. And I'm glad that he also uh, introduced the discussion of Acts chapter 2, because I think Acts chapter 2 in the uh, uh, Pentecost is very uh, significant for this uh, particular debate. And you might notice in verse 18, you know, for example, that the Holy Spirit baptism, the fulfillment of Jesus' uh, prediction that uh, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, well, the Holy Spirit was poured out from on high. And as uh, I, Howard Marshall, has pointed out here, the language of pouring of the Spirit, which is the initiation into the New Covenant Committee, uh, uh, the imager is not always that of immersion or burial. It, it can be, but it can also be pouring out. So I think that the, the issue of you know, how much more, uh, water or the mode is really doesn't speak to the heart of the issue, which is what, what biblical theology do we have for understanding and recognizing the status of the children uh, in the New Covenant community? Uh, and we should look to the uh, Old Covenant, uh, just as the New Testament church found many useful analogies in terms of the structure of worship, things which were underspecified in the New Testament documents themselves. Early Christian worship was largely modeled on the structure, even, even to the use of lectionary, in Jewish worship, but with a reinterpretation of the Jewish Passover meal in terms of what we now call the Lord's Supper. So in, in many cases where the New Testament is not explicit, it was early Christian practice was informed by Jewish uh, uh, analogies. But Two back, minutes. Two okay. minutes. Okay. I want to make a very, before we're done, I want to make a very important point about the Holy Spirit, about the conscious reception of the Holy Spirit, okay, is maybe the most important takeaway point for you today. Um, yeah, uh, several points. Uh, I start with some of the uh, latter points. Uh, yes, the uh, structure of uh, Jewish uh, synagogue worship is important for the New Testament, but in synagogues there was no singing. And in early churches there was singing, so Christians did something new. They did not just follow Jewish precedent. When singing came into uh, Jewish synagogues, that was in the 5th and 6th century, and it was controversial. Read the Talmud. Um, uh, uh, secondly, uh, 
the, that is again the fallacy of uh, thinking that baptizo means baptize when uh, uh, references to the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, are linked with baptism. But baptizo doesn't mean baptize. Baptizo means, in a physical sense, insertion. But we are not physically inserted into the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is a transcendent reality, not a physical reality. So when we come to that passage, we need to assume that we have a metaphorical meaning. And the metaphorical meaning for baptizo is to be overwhelmed by, like to be overwhelmed by debt or to be overwhelmed by wine, being a drunk. The other word baptizo is also used. Uh, and so when, instead of translating the baptism of the, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we are overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. We are fused with the Holy Spirit. So, uh, to, to use baptize and then derive from that even how much water is used uh, is simply due to the fallacy of thinking that the word baptizo has anything to do with water uh, and with uh, water uh, baptism. Uh, uh, an argument meant uh, earlier about the uh, birth and covenant, uh, I would say, and I've actually not really thought about that much, but uh, uh, the concept of new covenant is not linked with families and how parents educate their families. The new covenant is linked with uh, Jesus coming, yeah. with Jesus being the Messiah. Uh, and so John 1 says that what we have is not uh, as a result of birth, but of the new birth. Thank you. And I'll just say, um, uh, we're, we'll have Q&A immediately following. So if you want to start lifting your hand, we have a couple of microphones coming around. OK, pardon. And I'll just say simply that I think what, what this whole hour illustrates is simply that there is mystery surrounding things like sacraments that make it where faithful Bible reading, scripture affirming Christians can differ on these interpretations as with church government, as with whether or not to sing and how to sing and what to sing. We might differ. And how can we continue to affirm the unity we have as I have with these three colleagues? And that's the fun of why you want to come to Gordon-Conwell Seminary, because you never have this discussion at Westminster Seminary. It's so fun to have here. Thank you. You guys are terrific. And uh, whenever I hear my colleagues like this, it's very humbling for me, because they know so much, and you put it into a relatively succinct uh, fashion. <laughs> Who has our first uh, question over here? And then our second question, microphone over here, very good. And just keep your hands going, keep the microphones going. First of all, I wanna thank all of you guys. Um, it's a beautiful thing to see this place as a place where men and women faculty can be in all things unity and, and no, things in unity, essential, I'm butchering it, but I think you theologians and smart people know what I'm trying to say. Um, Got it. Um, anyway, so here's my question specifically to Dr. Schnappel. Given the historical and New Testament background of the word baptizo, why did the early church seem to promote child baptism given their historical and cultural proximity to the New Testament world? I'm not a church historian, uh, but uh, I don't want to use it as an excuse. Uh, uh, now, of course, uh, infant baptism came in later, and as uh, uh, Dr. Davis explained, there were some very strange views uh, connected with that as well, because Christians would delay baptism. They thought, ideally, you are baptized on your deathbed, which means you would be an adult, uh, because baptism forgives all sins. Uh, and uh, you, you mentioned Tertullian, and there were others who had that uh, view as well. So it seems very early there were very strange views connected with baptism uh, uh, developing. Uh, whether there were other developments uh, connected with, um, uh, which would be the, uh, in the fourth century Constantine, uh, uh, that some people, bishops, wanted to make uh, everyone a Christian. In Germany, we had, now that was several hundred years later, the. Uh, a strange uh, practice of uh, uh, the Saxonians being, they were giving the option, either you go into the river, 
to be baptized or we will kill you and then throw you into the river. <laughs> and so some were baptized and some were killed. Uh, uh, which again uh, reflects, of course, a very wrong view of what uh, uh, even ministry is uh, and, and what baptism <laughs> surely is. A question over here, please. Yes, I'd like no, to please, direct this. Please stand and tell us your name. Sure, my name is Colbury Martin. Okay. And I'd like to address it to Dr. Davis. Um, in reference to your point on a historical grounding for practice, um, I was wondering if you could touch on the Didache. And from my understanding, much of the focus of the, that early practice was on um, immersion in living water, as well as instruction for fasting um, for believers before they were baptized. And I don't believe you could you know, have infants fast, so I just wondered if you could touch on that point. Oh, it's true. I think that the, uh, the issue in the Didache, which, you know, mid-second century or thereabouts, maybe earlier, according to some scholars, the issue, I think there is a variety in the ways in which baptism was administered. You know, if you have uh, hot water, fine, cold water, fine, running water, preferably, and so forth, so a little bit of uh, flexibility. Uh, let me also recommend that you take a look at the Anthony Lane article, which is uh, referenced on, on my handout, and he makes the argument, based on his reading not only the New Testament, but also early patristic literature, that there was probably a variety of practices in early Christianity in different parts of the Greco-Roman world, and I think he's, he's got it right. And that's uh, not the basis of my view, but it's certainly supportive of my view that, again, there may be a number of acceptable answers that can uh, have scriptural warrants. So my sort of uh, bottom line takeaway for you is that you are within your epistemic and exegetical rights to wind up either in a Presbyterian or uh, a Baptist church. And I, I acknowledge that in some cultural situations, uh, adult-only baptism may be the way to go. I say may be the way to go. So I think this is an area uh, of discretion. Now, uh, let me just say a quick point about Acts 2.38. And I uh, say, so if you don't remember anything I've said here, it seems to me that maybe the, the most important point for the renewal of baptismal practices in American churches today is not whether or not to baptize infants. I think that's a secondary question. I think it's to repair the broken link between baptism and the call to repentance and the reception of the gift of the Holy Spirit because that link was broken in the post-apostolic church, especially in the uh, patristic era with the growth of cessationists in which it was uh, most Christians did not have any conscious awareness of the reception of the Holy Spirit. I think that is the big problem today. So I, I challenge you and your baptismal practice here to try to reestablish the link between the New Testament call to repentance, okay, and a the expectation that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you know, you know that you have received the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Our next question is here in the middle. Please stand your name. And then who has a microphone for the next one after that? Over here. Great. Hi, my name is Jenna. Um, I actually have a question based on conversations I've had with some peers and was hoping you guys could speak into it a little bit. Um, but where, what is your stance on a practical level when it comes to rebaptism? For instance, if you have someone who was baptized as an infant but um, wants to be baptized later in life, as a pastor, what do you do? Let's start with Dr. Singleton and then work our way down. What's your practice for rebaptism? Presbyterians have a rite called the renewal of baptismal vows, where we are able to once again remember your baptism. Remember, Luther was the one that coined that phrase, remember your baptism, and he couldn't remember his. So every time we watch a baptism, we remember. And there are times when you have a, a new season in your faith that you may want to renew your baptismal vows. We just don't administer water to you at that time, but we allow the person to remember that they were baptized symbolically. Dr. So, Schnabel? There can be no rebaptism because there's only one baptism. Right, right. And so Baptists would argue that those who were baptized as infants were actually not baptized. Something else happened, uh, but it was not baptism as it should have practiced. And so when they baptized someone who was baptized maybe as a, a Lutheran or Roman Catholic and then comes to faith, uh, that uh, they would not call that rebaptism but simply baptism. That, of course, then means that uh, I have to regard my uh, Lutheran uh, friends as not being baptized. 
Uh, and uh, uh, I know a bishop quite well. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, and so we, in a sense, we avoid, uh, we avoid that, but uh, uh, he, knows, uh, he knows what I believe. Uh, and of course, and, and that is the point that uh, Dr. Davis made, faith, repentance, uh, uh, being in the Holy Spirit, this is what matters. Uh, the rite of baptism itself, if that's the only thing we have, it doesn't matter at all. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Yeah, just a uh, quick point. My wife and I face this, uh, I think, personally and existentially, uh, even though I, I believe there are strong biblical arguments for pedo-baptism. I was baptized as an adult convert, okay? Whereas my wife, uh, Robin, who was baptized as an infant uh, in a liberal uh, congregational church in Connecticut, uh, because I think she came to an Augustinian and uh, historic uh, uh, Christian and Reformed view that there is, in fact, uh, one baptism and that a baptism uh, administered by a non-heretical minister in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit could be recognized as a valid baptism. And so that you can sort of own, as Dr. Singel said, your, uh, that which was earlier done, done for you. I'm against baptizing non-believers, and people who baptize them are willing to do so if they're tiny enough. Uh, they won't baptize a non-believer at 10 years old or 50 or 80, but they'll baptize them if they're a little tiny enough and can't uh, prevent it. So uh, I'm against it. And uh, I've baptized a gajillion people in my years of ministry who were uh, supposedly baptized as infants. And I have found that every single one of them was extremely grateful to be able to have the uh, wonderful consequential baptism, recognizing that they have received the Spirit, that they have repented, that they do belong to Christ. It's enormously wonderful. And they've invited many, many friends and family members to their baptisms, and it's a great witness. So I urge you to think about the evangelistic opportunity that this will represent in your ministry if you can do it. Now, you know there are some churches in the world you can't do it. I just had a conversation with a former student who is a pastor in a uh, Lutheran uh, church in uh, Germany. Uh, the Lutherans will not allow that. They simply will not allow it. So you have to sneak off to a Baptist, but it's okay. Uh, uh, make it happen, and you'll be surprised at the blessing it'll represent in people's lives and in their families. Thank you. Just Our to next... quickly uh, <laughs> respond to Dr. Stewart. What? Uh, that, that is what? A... <laughs> what? <laughs> the... Uh... I think to push the logic a little bit further, that's what we're here to do here, I think that the, the consequence of, you might say, a hardcore Baptist hermeneutic or a hardcore Presbyterian uh, argument is to say that, well, uh, the Baptist is uh, committing a sin by not baptizing infants. And the Baptist can say that, well, the hardcore Presbyterian is committing a sin uh, by baptizing infants. And I don't think that either one is the case because I don't think that the Baptist... Uh, is not uh, ignoring any explicit example or command of Scripture relative to baptisms. Whereas at the same time here, I think that the, uh, uh, the Presbyterian uh, is not uh, ignoring or denying any explicit prohibition of Scripture. And that both the Baptist and the present Presbyterian can be within a, r a realm of ecclesiastical permissibility, uh, each uh, having sufficient and rather plausible uh, arguments for their position. Our next question is over here, and we have uh, just a few minutes left, so get in here if you want to get in here. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Dan. Uh, my question is regarding uh, finding a middle ground for practice. For those against baptism, uh, genuine concerns were raised for including the family. So what practices would you suggest in place of water immersion to acknowledge or bless the children of believers? And for those that adhere to infant baptism, what issues uh, do you present with practicing anything less than baptism for infants? Well, I would say that there's a number of things you can do for anybody in any family. And I think churches ought to be praying for children. So uh, I would say in, in church prayer meetings, in prayer groups, uh, regular prayer for families is a very wonderful thing to do. Uh, so th always try to be thinking of things that really relate to kids. You know, statistics show that about 90% of all people 
who declare themselves as real biblical believers in Christ uh, will also tell you that they came to Christ prior to age 19, 90%. So evangelism of children, children's Sunday school, evangelistic programs and neighborhoods and so on for children are fantastically significant and anything you can do for a family. But I think you can do blessings and the blessings when a baby comes into the world you, you take the child before the church and you have the, the family there and lots of people come and it's a big event. Sometimes you get a free meal afterwards, which is very good if you're a Baptist because they don't pay like the Presbyterians. And so uh, you have a lot, of, a lot of fun with the family. It's not too but, late to change you your mind, a, Doug. Not too late. Neither group play, pays enough, but I still say the Presbyterians pay way more than the Baptists. Important ecclesiastical truth. Uh, right. With right. retirement accounts. But Amen. you can make a great fuss over a baby and over a family and over loving people. You can make a great fuss over somebody turning 90 in a church. And you can have a special time of prayer for them and so on. So you don't have to do anything that's non-biblical, but to pray for people and to recognize them and to declare the love of the church family for them all of those things are very valid and so i say don't dedicate but offer prayers of blessing and presentation of anybody at any age you're, what you're not doing something that is a right you're doing something that is part of the practice of loving people in your community and if one talks about the covenant i would say if we only do like a right whatever we call it uh, uh, with a, a newborn child, which is fine. Uh, but then what parents would do is pray with a child, for the child, read scripture, uh, love the child. This is covenant behavior. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And that constitutes the real blessing over many years. And I'm sure there are many here who have had parents like this and that we are believers today because of their covenant love demonstrated every single day, not on one specific occasion, as important as that uh, may be. And Dan, in our tradition, I would always say in the preface to baptism that we expect that one day this child will be back in this same place, standing on their own two feet, able to affirm today what their parents are claiming for them. And so that's kind of a combination of the two. There's a question right here in the middle. Hi, I'm Courtney. Um, I have a question about who is officiating a baptism. So a friend of mine is in a tradition where anybody baptizes anybody within the church. So let's say my friend comes to Christ, we go out to the lake and I baptize them. What is the thought process? As a Presbyterian, I was like, oh, no, that's, you know, but what's the thought process about who is administering what human is mediating, whatever you want to use, um, what human is mediating this baptism experience and what's the theological, biblical, historical precedent for that? Yeah, maybe I can begin and I read the New Testament. So I, I'm referring to the New Testament. Uh, First Corinthians chapter one. There were people in the Corinthian church who evidently believed it's uh, perhaps important to baptize them. Uh, and they were comparing their missionaries and their teachers uh, and uh, uh, latched on to Paul or Apollos or Peter. And Paul uh, says, uh, I only baptized, and then he mentions a couple of names, and then says, and, and that's it. And then a verse lady comes back and he says, oh, by the way, I also baptized uh, uh, another person. For Paul, it was evidently not important that he would baptize anyone. Mm -hmm. It was not the chief, let's say, missionary or the main official. Uh, it was not even part of the process of coming uh, uh, to sell, of receiving salvation. Because if receiving salvation is linked with baptism, then Paul has to baptize everyone who comes to faith. So it seems Paul says it doesn't really matter. He leaves uh, the ad admin, uh, administration of baptism evidently to his uh, co-worker. Now, obviously, when we have elders, uh, we have approved leadership of the church. Uh, and so an argument can be made, which is not a direct result of a particular scripture, but thinking of uh, a, a, a church structure in the New Testament, which is very simple, uh, that the recognized leadership of the church is responsible for what happens in the church. And therefore, they are responsible for the Lord's Supper, uh, for baptism, which doesn't mean they have to do it themselves necessarily. 
just to follow up on that, I, I would say that, of course, we recognize that uh, the New Testament does not have a highly developed uh, ecclesiology and that uh, the ecclesiology such as it is or church order in 1 Corinthians looks different from that in the pastoral epistles or even Philippians for that matter. But I think I would agree with uh, uh, Dr. Schnabel here that, and again, speaking from a Presbyterian and Reformed tradition, which is basically Augustinian, uh, it's not a matter of sin or not sin in terms of uh, who does uh, uh, the baptism here, but what might be expedient and uh, prudent. So from the Presbyterian Reform point of view, it is expedient and uh, appropriate that the minister of the word, because the sacrament is a form of the word in the word of gospel. So those who have been recognized and gifted as teachers of the word, it seems fitting that uh, they also administer uh, the sacrament. And there may also a benefit of maintaining the unity of the congregation if someone who has been you know, recognized, gifted, and called as a leader uh, exercises that particular office. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry that we have time for one more question. That's all, and somebody has the microphone over here. <laughs> Hi, yes, thank you all for being here so much. Um, my name is David, and I want to introduce you to Nathaniel right here. Baptist. And um, I want to ask a question that I anticipate receiving as a future pastor, uh, which is, let's say this four-month-old grows up, and at age three, four, five, six, um, <clears throat> tragically, we lose him, right? And so I come to you as a Baptist pastor or as a Presbyterian pastor, and I say, what happened to my son? Yeah. Uh, maybe one from each, each side of this. How, how do you respond to that? We lost our first son a few days after he was born. So I know exactly what you mean. We didn't baptize him because baptism does not convey salvation. And, and I think all, I mean, that has been said, all four of us agree. And so we rely on the grace of God, on the goodness of God. But yeah, that's all I, I, we really, I think, can say. Uh, different answers have been suggested in the history of the church. Most are quite, they are more philosophical. Uh, uh, some of them, uh, some theological, uh, none uh, exegetical, because there is no text that we can actually exegete, really, uh, on that uh, question. But we know that God is good. God is our Father. And that's all I really need to know. Yeah, it's a great opportunity to teach theology proper, the doctrine of God. Because that's the answer. You point to who God is, what he's like, what we know about him from scripture, his care and concern for uh, children, Jesus' demonstrations of that. And you don't try to tell people something. You, you don't try to make some verse in a psalm or in the middle of Job where, you know, if you decided to say the Hebrew of Job says this, nobody could counter you because they have no idea what it says. Uh, but uh, you don't try to fool anything, anybody with anything. But you do say, listen, we all trust in a loving God. There are all kinds of things that happen like this. It's happened to plenty of other people. It used to happen far more commonly than it does today that children would die. And uh, God is good. And when you get to heaven, you're going to say God did everything just right. You're never going to say, oh, man, now that I'm in heaven, I can see all the things God did wrong. No, just the opposite. Now that I'm in heaven, I see that God did everything perfectly. And that's part of what faith in God means. Amen. Agreed. Dr. Singleton, you have the final word. Just enjoy the discussion. It's, it's part of what makes this place magic, is to be able to love each other and have these discussions with grace abounding. So go to class, enjoy, and may God be with you this afternoon. <laughs>